Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's journey through Torah. This week we are in Parsha Zav, the second portion in the book of Leviticus, the book of Vayikra. Remember, Vayikra means, and he called. The Hebrew name of this book starts with Yahweh calling out to Moshe. Now, what we have as we ended the last book, as we ended Exodus, was they built the tabernacle so that Yahweh would dwell within them. Uh, literally, that's how he says it, I will dwell within them, not just among them. And when they, when the, after they, they completed the tabernacle, the glory of Yahweh came and, and just hit the tabernacle, but no one could go in, no one could enter, no one could draw near, no one could approach, which kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Which means the tabernacle in and of itself wasn't the completion of the plan. Okay. Uh, Yahweh had a means for us to be drawn near to him. And this is where the sacrifices come in, which bad translation sacrifice, literally in the Hebrew, it's korban, which means something brought near, something that is brought near to Yahweh, which allows us to approach him and to be brought near into his presence. Okay. So last week, and as we open the book, we talk about the different offerings that are brought. And as you're bringing the offering, it's not really as much about the offering as it is the person who's bringing it. Now, the heart of the person who's bringing it, and of course, the offering is a representation of the heart of the one who was bringing it. So when you bring an offering, you had to have the right motive in doing so. It's not just a matter of an outward show. You had to actually, like if you were bringing a sin offering, or if you were bringing a trespass offering, if you were bringing something like these, well, there had to be repentance, and in some cases, a restitution made before you brought the offering. And then if you were bringing a Thanksgiving offering, well, you had to express thanks. You had to give thanks to Yahweh. So the, the offerings were an expression of the heart of the one who was bringing it, right? Now, this week is Tzav. This week, we go over the idea of, uh, okay, so the people brought the offerings, and this week is the, now the priests receive them. So what do they do with them now that they receive them? So last week focused on the one who was bringing it. This week, the focus is on uh, the priests and the Levites, the Kohen and the Leviim, to, uh, to receive these and what they are to do with them. And we give those instructions, and those instructions fall right before the consecration of the priests, which we'll cover in chapter 8 right here. We're going to talk about the consecration of the priesthood, which we know is also an example of you as a holy people. Uh, because Yahweh is holy and he's called you to be holy. So what does that mean? Now, obviously, we're not all priests, okay? But we all have a role in the kingdom where Yahweh is asking us to help people draw near and help us to learn and help us to uh, study the word and help us to live in community with one another and help us all point our hearts towards the Father. We all have some responsibility here in the kingdom and keeping that focus on Yahweh and his kingdom and his word. But the priesthood has some other responsibilities to cover as well. Okay, so, and also I, I want to point out this progression here. Something you're going to see here in this Parsha, as well as throughout the book of Leviticus, when you get into the ideas of holiness, the uh, you are set apart. Okay, and as a set apart people, you have some responsibility here. You have to be careful of your motives. You have to be careful of your heart. You have to be careful of how you do things, the way you do things, why you do things. And, uh, and so the closer you are to the presence of Yahweh, the more you have to be aware of your life and, and your heart and your motives. And that just keeps us in a constant state of Yahweh search me. And if there's anything unclean within me, you know, what is our idea? That we repent, that we get it out. And it's just that idea of Yahweh, I live for you. I don't live for myself. All right. And, um, so as we're doing that, the, as you, the closer you get to the tabernacle, the closer you get to the presence of Yahweh, the more responsibility you have to be aware of these things. Like Moshe had a greater responsibility than Aaron did, and Aaron had a greater responsibility than the rest of the Levites, and the Levites had a greater responsibility than just anyone from among any of the tribes. See, the closer you got to the holy things, the more you were to safeguard and protect and, and keep the holy things. So you had to protect the sanctity of the holy things. And that was the roles of the, of the Leviim and the Kohanim. So the, the, that's uh, this week we get into the portion. Last week it was to tell the people when they bring the offering, it basically representation of themselves. This week it's command. Command Aaron and his sons. Now, notice the change of progression there. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them when they bring an offering and representation of themselves, whereas this week, command Aaron and his sons. 
Again, that shows the idea of the closer you are to the presence of Yahweh, the more accountability and responsibility you have to protect and honor the sanctity of the things that he has declared holy. You are not to profane the holy things. And as a holy people, we need to understand that. And the job of the Kohanim and the Levi'im was to teach and instruct the people of Israel regarding these things. So concerning Aaron and his sons and this whole progression that we get into this week, Leviticus 10, 3, which I know is at next week's portion, but again, pointing to this idea of Aaron and his sons were, were set apart to a certain degree of uh, holiness and accountability that not just every person of Israel was, right? Uh, it says, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. In Luke 12, 48, it says, whoever much is given, to him much will be required. And whom men have committed much, of him they will ask more. Again, uh, as a teacher among the people, you have a greater responsibility. And that's why Yahweh is saying, to those who are near me, there is a greater accountability. And people look at you. People are watching you to be a representation of Yahweh. Now, I know, um, that's where we get into a lot of problems is when we look at each other and say, well, well that's the God that you serve, or that's how, you know, be careful doing that. Cause that's not what we're supposed to do. Okay. But on the other side of that, we are supposed to work together and live with one another and to help each other on the path. And Rav Shaul said as well, imitate me as I imitate Mashiach, right? Well, he didn't say imitate me in everything that I do. He said, imitate me as I imitate Mashiach. In other words, we're all fallible. We all make mistakes, but in the areas where we're pursuing the father, we need to work together and, and pursue that with one another. Right. Okay. So one of the responsibilities that we find for the, for the priesthood was to keep the fire on the altar. Now, one of the amazing things regarding this altar is that uh, when, when the altar was put in place and, and it was lit, it was not a priest who lit the fire. The way the scripture reads is the fire came from before the Lord and lit that altar. So that phrase before the Lord is often used in regard to the holy place in the Mishkan. So literally it would read like fire came essentially uh, down from heaven and through the, through the, the holy place into the altar. And so that fire was lit from Yahweh and it is that fire that uh, all the offerings were there and they had to keep this fire going. They had to keep this continual fire lit. Now, when you put this in the context that the off the uh, altar is a representation of our heart and we are to keep that fire burning, we are to keep that fire lit. It's showing that uh, Yahweh lights that fire in our hearts and in our lives and to burn out the things that don't need to be there and to create a way for us to be in his presence and to be with him and to be represented there and just to have a relationship with him and to come before him. And, uh, and, and, but it's that fire that needs to stay lit. We don't bring strange fire before Yahweh, right? So we see this in regard to the altar and the menorah. The altar was to have the, a constant fire on it. It was to never go out. And that was quite a task when they were moving it too. uh, consider that fire, they would uh, allow it to smolder and never go completely out, even when they were moving from place to place. Quite a task, isn't it? And the menorah, the same thing. Uh, the menorah we see in Exodus 27, 20, and 21, that the menorah was to burn continually in the holy place as well. For the altar, Leviticus 6, verses 12 to 13, the fire on the altar is to be kept burning, and it is not to go out. And the priest was to put the wood on it every day and arrange the burnt offering on it and put on the peace offerings, and the fire is kept burning continually and it was not to go out, right? And in the morning, there was a, a tamid. The tamid means a continual offering. There was a tamid put on in the morning before any of the other offerings. And at the end of the day, after all the other offerings, there was a tamid put on that was to burn all night. So when the priest got there first thing in the morning, he was to take the ashes from the offering that was there all night and remove the ash from the altar. Because if you have uh, a lot of ash around a fire, that ash it won't allow the air through and it will essentially smother that fire. It will not allow the air to flow through that fire, through the wood and, 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 uh, and the, let the fire breathe as it needs to. It will smolder and put itself out. What we can learn from this is the things from yesterday, the things that are burned away, the things that have happened, the things that are gone. We need to take these things and remove them so that we can allow today 
to burn brightly and today to burn uh, in the presence of Yahweh. So something else we see here. He is to take up the ashes that the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Literally, the way that this would read is he shall lift up the ash that the fire consumed or ate the Ola offering. So this fire consumes this offering, and uh, it's like the, the, the flames engulf it, in, in essence, eating the, the offering and, um, and just reducing it all, all the, down to ash. And this ash was to be removed. We're not to live there. We're not to keep those ashes there. Each day is new with Yahweh. And so we remove those things so that the fire is not extinguished. In other words, don't let the fire go out, whether by, by any means that's there, whether by intentionally putting the fire out or neglecting it so that it goes out. Either way, we have a responsibility. Don't intentionally put out the fire, you know, by water or by smothering it or, or whatever, or neglecting it. By neglect, again, it'll build up the ash. Uh, uh, we're not providing wood for it. Uh, we're not giving kindling when the kindling is needed. Um, putting the wood in a proper order so that it burns properly. You know, we're just kind of throwing the wood in there, chucking it in there or moving the ash away from the flame. We're not doing any of that. That's, that's being neglectful. So again, you don't just light a fire and it burns you. When you light a fire, you have to tend it. And so Yahweh has lit that fire in our hearts. He has drawn us near to him. And as he's done that, we need to tend that fire daily. How do we do this? We do this by prayer. We do this by studying the word. We do this by reading the word, by uh, daily devotions, by um, living life, doing the things that Yahweh has asked us to do in the kingdom, by doing these things. This is how we keep that fire burning in our hearts and in our lives. Now, regarding the offerings and things that were put on it, uh, the priesthood were to receive portions from the offerings that were given to provide for themselves, their families, these things. Because Yahweh had said, the priesthood, you know, the, the Leviim, the Kohanim, they had no inheritance in the land. They would be cared for by Yahweh. And how did he do that? Was by the offerings that the people were, were brought. Now, because the offering brought was holy, the people who partook of these things also had to be holy, had to be set apart as well. You couldn't just have anyone to eat from, from these offerings. Now, if you brought a peace offering, you got portions of that back that you were supposed to eat. Okay, but it's still in a holy place. But the other offerings, there were other offerings that as you brought the priesthood were to receive portions of that as well. We see in Leviticus 6.18, it says, Every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it as a due forever throughout your generations from the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Whatever touches them shall be holy, which is interesting. It says, whatever touches them shall be holy. Now, this concept in the scripture of... Um, so touching something made them holy. It's not really the way that the scripture t defines things for us. Okay. Holiness isn't, isn't shown like impurity, uh, pardon the terminology, but it's not contagious. Okay. Uh, holiness is not contagious. Impurity is contagious. You can become unclean by uh, someone who was unclean to touch you. So this could be better translated as anyone who is to touch these must be in a holy state. And, and that is just being a matter of set apart, clean these things. Now, what about the impurity was I talking about? So impurity can be around you and in some cases can be forced upon you, even accidental. Now, mind you, not all impurity, not all unclean is sin. Some was just a state of unclean. Example, if you touched a dead body, you'd be considered unclean. You're not sinful in doing so, but you would be rendered in a state of unclean, right? Uh, so touching a dead body or coming in contact with someone who was quarantined, coming in contact with someone who was unclean would render you in a state of unclean. You would have to mikvah, sundown, you would be clean again, right? But to be holy is an intentional action to live your life according to the ways that Yahweh had said. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm going to be very clear in this, that anything you do can make you holy. That's not it at all. Yahweh said he makes you holy, but then he defines for us how we are to live that way. So my thinking, the way this better translates for us, for, for understanding, is Yahweh makes us holy and sets us apart and says, now live it. And then he defines ways that we can bring defilement into our life that would contaminate us and make us unclean. So he says, I have made you holy. I have set you apart. Live as such and do not defile yourselves or do things that bring defilement. We see this as well in 2 Corinthians 
uh, 6, verses 16 to 18, where it says, What agreement is the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them, I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. To touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So when he says, do not touch the unclean things, you who carry his presence, this is actually quoting from Isaiah 52, verse 11, where it says, depart, depart, go out from there. Don't touch the unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of Yahweh. So again, uh, bearing the vessels of Yahweh, the idea is you who carry the holy things, you are who are guarding the holy things. And then we are told to guard our hearts. Yahweh dwells within you. You are to guard the holy thing, which is his presence within you because he said he is holy. And as he dwells in you, he said you are holy because he sets you apart. He consecrates you. Okay. Now, because of this, there's a greater responsibility for Aaron and his sons and the Leviim to understand the clean and clean and the holy and the common, which we see again in Leviticus 10, verses 10 through 11, when Yahweh spoke to Aaron directly. Okay, a lot of times when we read in the scriptures, it says that Yahweh told Moshe to tell Aaron, or Yahweh told Moshe to tell Aaron and his sons, or to tell Aaron and his sons and the Leviim, or to tell the sons of Israel. Here, it is Yahweh speaking to Aaron directly, and he says that you are to put a difference between the holy and the unholy and between the unclean and the clean and teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh has spoke to them by the hand of Moshe. So the job of the Kohenim and the Leviim was to understand the differences between clean and clean and holy and common and to teach it to the people of Israel so that they would understand it. It's not something where the priesthood was to have this secret knowledge nobody else could have. It was the idea of they were to, to do this and hold themselves in this place of accountability, but they were also to teach and instruct the children of Israel so that they would know these things and also hold themselves and the priesthood to a place of accountability as well. We also see in Leviticus 20, verse 3, where it says, I will set my face against that man. And I will cut him off from, from among his people because he has given his seed the Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. See this? A person being cut off because he brought defilement to the sanctuary. Which again, if you want to put this in a, in a greater context, sanctuary could be you. You are a sanctuary. You are a place for Yahweh to dwell. So not, don't bring this, this spiritual defilement of uncleanness to the sanctuary. Numbers 19.20 says, The man shall be unclean and shall not purify himself. That soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he has defiled the sanctuary of Yahweh. The water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. So what he's saying here, if someone was rendered unclean, and they were just uh, rebellious and obstinate and refused to be cleansed. You know, that's, that's essentially what it's saying. And it's like, oh, I don't need that. That's not, that's not necessary. I can do what I want. Yahweh is saying, you will bear your own guilt. Okay, which we know the importance of that, that Yahweh bore our guilt, our disease, our sin. He took all of these things upon, you know, this is what Yeshua did for us, right? And, um, and so we, 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 that's a burden we cannot bear ourselves. And then uh, Psalm 134, verses 1 through 3, talking about guarding the offering on the altar. This is a song of ascent. Come bless Yahweh, all you servants of Yahweh, who stand by night in the house of Yahweh. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless Yahweh. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May he who made heaven and earth. So again, you who stand by night, it's, it's ha'omdim, uh, b'vayth Yahweh v'lelot. So here, you who omdim, you who amad, you who stand in the house of Yahweh in, in, the, in the night. Uh, what are they doing when they're standing in the house of Yahweh at night? Well, they're tending the altar. Okay, The priesthood who was there at night, the, the uh, tabernacle and the temple, didn't function like that at night. So they were to tend the altar where that last offering of the day was put on and to make sure that fire stayed lit and to make sure that offering was completely consumed by morning. And as they're doing so, what would they be doing to fill their time? They would be praying, they would be singing songs, they would be worshiping, they would be doing these things and tending that fire. And so this word to stand is also related to the prayers that are given every, uh, sometimes three times a day by many around the world, okay? So those who, the Amidah, the prayers, that stand as we stand before Yahweh as we're doing these things, but they were to stand guard and keep the holy things holy. Also, um, 
Sandy Gard is, is keeping the perpetual offering ascending. That's what we're doing. We're keeping the perpetual offering, the Tamid offering ascending. Again, this is the one that was put on at night that was to be ascending all night long and be reduced to ash by the morning. Now in Romans 12, one and two, we have a picture of us. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So this idea of standing before the Father, protecting the perpetual offering, doing these things, we stand before him. And that's the same idea of uh, uh, putting on his armor. We're taking... Uh, what he has given us to do, and we are walking in what he has equipped us with, which we'll get to here when the priesthood is being consecrated. When Yahweh has, has called you to be something and he has set you apart as holy, then he will equip you for what he has called you to do. Now, if he says you are a holy people, he's not going to leave you high and dry where you can't walk this way. He's going to show you how to do this. He's going to show you how to live and how to walk and how we are to uh, do things in our life. And this is another thing Yeshua came to show us, guys. He came to show us how to live properly and in perfect relationship with Yahweh and with one another. Uh, Peter, in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, says, Brace your minds for action, keep your balance, and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in everything you do. For it is written, Kedoshim, you shall be, for I am Kadosh. Holy ones you are to be, because I am holy. And in 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the Messiah Yeshua. Again, if we are living stones, if we are building a spiritual house, that's a place for him to dwell. If we're doing that, we need to live this way. And in 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. And in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, Yeshua says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its flavor, how will it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So idea here, salt accompanied the offerings that went on the altar. Everything, that, uh, the offerings that went on, they were accompanied with salt. Why? Because salt is a preservative among many other things. Um, and it is a reminder we are to live our lives in a way of, of being put on the altar. Again, you are salt and you are to be put your life on that altar. Romans 12 again, right? The connection between us and the altar. Salt wasn't just for us. Salt was also going on the altar with those offerings that were given as well. Okay, so what about the consecration of Aaron and his sons? The consecration of the, the, the priesthood, the consecration of them. What are we doing here? Okay, well, first off, Aaron was anointed, and then the offerings were made. So what I, I want to point out here is the anointing in and of itself did not set Aaron in his office. He was anointed, then the offerings were made, and then there was a connection made between the offerings, between the altar, and, and the people, and Aaron and his sons. And there's all these things, there's a connection in all of this together, working together, functioning together, for the means of Yahweh saying uh, that Aaron and his sons, they were to minister to him, but they also provided intercession for the people and represented the people to Yahweh and represented Yahweh to the people. Okay, so the type of uh, offerings that are given here, this uh, ordination ceremony for Aaron and his sons included three types of offerings. We see in Leviticus 8.14 that there was a sin offering that was done, Leviticus 8, 18, there was a burnt offering or the Ola offering that was given. And then in Leviticus 8, 22, we have the Ram of Consecration. So we're gonna talk about this briefly here, all right? So one of the things I wanna point out is that when the priesthood was consecrated, again, there was a connection between the people and the Mishkan and the implements of it. 
It wasn't just the people and, and Yahweh, that the function of the tabernacle, the, 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 as the person who brought the offering, he had to see the connection between himself, that offering, that altar, and the presence of Yahweh. Okay? Uh, it's not just us directly going into the presence of Yahweh. Okay? We, we were brought there, represented there, and again, a picture of what Yeshua did for us. We can't just go in, in and of ourselves. We are brought into the presence of Yahweh. And again, I, I can't stress enough, this is the idea of what Yeshua did for us. But the consecration of the priesthood, let's kind of go through the ceremony here really quick, okay? Uh, starting in Le Leviticus 8, So Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, the garments, the anointing oil, the bull of the sin offering, the two rams of the basket of matzah, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So Moses did as Adonai commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, this is what Adonai has commanded to be done. So he assembled all the people together in the view of the door of the courtyard. The, it's the assembly is Ada, which means witnesses. Ed is witnesses. And together, all these people were witnessing the holy ones being set apart and being anointed for their service. This was not done in private. This was done where all Israel could see and understand what was about to happen here. And, uh, and, and, and the priesthood was being equipped and consecrated and set apart and dedicated in sight of all the people, which kind of makes me think of as well in Acts 1.8, where it says, You will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and through all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yahweh has called us to be witnesses for him here in the earth, as well as the idea of the Shema, calling us to be witnesses for Yahweh as well. Shema, many say every day, right? From Deuteronomy 6, 4, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, here Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Written in the Torah scrolls, we have two letters that are written larger than uh, than any of the other letters in this phrase, with an ayin and a dalet, together the ayin and the dalet, form the word ed, which is a witness. As we declare this, we are testifying to the fact that we are witnesses for Yahweh, and he has called us to witness on, on behalf of him in his presence and to live in the earth as those witnesses that are set apart to him. Okay, so moving on for the consecration ceremony, Moshe brought Aaron and his sons, and he washed them with water. Another interesting thing, what pool or sea or spring or ocean was available to them near the tabernacle? None. There was none that was available to them. So where did they get the water from? They got the water from the rock. Where else would it come from? The water came from the rock. So when we think about the living water that was in the wilderness, what do we think of? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 4, where it says, They all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah. In John 4, 13 and 14, says Yeshua says, Everyone who drinks from this water, from the well they were at, will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. The water that I give him will become a fountain of water within him, springing up eternal life. And in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, we read, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this water was brought and this cleansing was given and this cleansing that was given as we are being set apart is a picture of how when we come to Yahweh, Yeshua cleanses us, right? We also see in Zechariah 13, 1, where it says, On that day there will be a fountain open for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Notice, not just sin, sin and uncleanness because not all unclean is sin, right? Which we touched on earlier. So to, to cleanse from sin and uncleanness, because it's not just repentance of sins, but to be clean before him as well. Okay, continuing with the ceremony. So Moshe brought Aaron and his sons, they washed him with water, and then Aaron was dressed in his priestly garments. Again, a change of covering, a change of, of uh, your robes, a change of your identity, if you will, right? What do we read about this? They're, they're, Aaron and his sons, they were given new clothes that testified of their new service, their new status among the people, their change and how all of these things were. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in Adonai. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness like a bridegroom wearing a priestly turban. 
like a bride adorning herself for her jewels. And Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a vast multitude that no one could count from every nation and all tribes and people and tongue was standing before the throne, and before the Lamb they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Okay, so again, moving back to the ceremony, they, Moshe brought Aaron and his sons, he washed them with water, dressed them in the priestly garments, and what happened next? Moshe took the anointing oil, and he anointed the tabernacle, and all that was in the tabernacle, and, and all of the implements that are used for the altar, and then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head, and he consecrated him to consecrate him. He anointed him to consecrate him and set him apart. Again, as this anointing oil was taken, which this oil was made specifically for this purpose, no other purpose was to be used there, and it was applied to the tabernacle and everything that was in it. Then he put the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him and consecrated him. Notice the anointing for the priesthood, it associated their connection to the holy things. This is one reason why they were to protect the sanctity of the holy things, because they were directly connected to the holy things. And the boundaries of their anointing was for their service to Yahweh. They, they were not to function outside of what they were anointed to do. They could not function outside of what they were anointed to do. They couldn't, uh, you know, just make up their own job description and do whatever they wanted. They were set apart for specific tasks and for specific things. They had to operate within those boundaries. So again, this consecration ceremony, Aaron, he brought Aaron and his sons and after he clothed them, then he brought the bull of the sin offering. And Aaron and his sons, they laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering. Moshe slaughtered it, and he took the blood, and he dabbed it onto the horns of the altar with his finger, and he purified the altar. And then he poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. The rest of the bull was dealt accordingly with some of the altar, and some burnt outside the camp. Interesting thing regarding why was it a bull brought for a sin offering for Aaron and his sons, Whereas uh, for just another person of Israel, they would bring, you know, like uh, a goat or, a, you know, just something else, right? Why was it a bull for Aaron and his sons? Leviticus 4.3, it says, If the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to Yahweh for a sin offering. Now, a bull uh, represents strength, represents authority. It's a you know, very strong animal that they used back then to do things. And so all of these things together, it uh, it's shows uh, some prominence there. Now, Aaron and his sons, they had a role among Israel to where they had to, uh, they had to bear the holy things. And so they had responsibility for people that they were covering, so to speak. And if the anointed priest, notice it doesn't just say high priest, the anointed priest, the one who was anointed, Anointing is anointing is Mashiach or Mashiach. If the one who was anointed sins, he would bring guilt on everything under his authority. Okay, so that's why if the high priest sinned, he would bring guilt upon the people. So consider this as well. Again, the idea, the picture of Yeshua, that the, he was without sin because if he had sin, he would have brought guilt on, on on everything under his authority, which was everything. Okay, and he didn't bring guilt on everything. He came. To, uh, to deal with sin in regards to everything under his authority, to reestablish that relationship with us, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, Leviticus, back to Leviticus 8, 1 through 36, this consecration ceremony. He then presented the ram for the burnt offering, and then Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and then Moshe slaughtered it and splashed the blood around the altar, and he did the, according to the order of the burnt offering. So when they would lay their hands on this offering, it's, it's the idea of making an investment into this animal you're leaning your hand your hand on the head of this animal making an investment in them and he's you may have declarations to go over them as well like the sin offerings that are brought uh, there was confession of sin of these things that are done regarding this offering that's that's brought and uh, and so uh, uh, as they brought this all of Aaron and his sons that would lay their hands on the head of this offering and again, making an investment in there, the so they would kind of have an identity, a connection to this offering that's being brought. Then the second ram was brought, which is called the ram of ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. Moses slaughtered it, and he took some of its blood and he put it on. Now this is the one that were, that was a, where the blood was applied. He put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, and on the great toe of his right foot. 
And then Moses brought Aaron's sons and put some of the blood on the tips of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the great toes of their right feet. Moses splashed the blood around the altar. So this one, the ordination offering, was the one where the blood was taken and the blood was applied to the right earlobe, the right uh, thumb, and the right big toe. And the same blood was taken to the altar and splashed on it. Now, there aren't many places where you actually see blood being applied to an individual in the Scripture. Okay, even though you may have some people... Uh, praying and, and saying, you know, to apply the blood, the blood of Yeshua over a person here. The blood was given for atonement on the altar. Okay, there's there's very few instances in Scripture where you see blood being applied directly to a person. However, this is one of those scenarios. Another is where Moshe uh, at the, at the base of Mount Sinai, where Moshe pro, uh, read and proclaimed the words of the covenant with the book of the covenant and the offerings that were given there, and he splashed uh, the people with the with the blood and then uh, so that's one of the other instances that we see this being done this way now again why the ear the thumb and the and the feet well for the ear it's the things that you hear okay for the things that are that that are being heard that you hear clearly uh, that that the things that you hear being get for the purpose of atonement you know the blood being working on your behalf there for the means of atonement being set apart to yahweh all of these things being done uh, that you discern the things that you're hearing and, uh, and not to let anybody else kind of get in your head, so to speak, you know, and as far as the thumb, the work of your hands, the things that you do, okay, the, the, just the things that uh, just your, 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 the way you do things on a daily basis, just the working of your hands are clean and set apart and, and just the things that you do are, are holy and the things that you do as well. And then your, your, your big toe, again, your walk. Uh, just the, where you go, the places you hang out, the places that you do these things, your walk, your spiritual walk per se, how you live your life. And all these things, there's a connection between you and that altar, right? And that our life is to be on that altar. Okay, moving on. So he took the fat, uh, the fat tail and all the fat that was on the innards, as well as the cover for the liver, the two kidneys, the fat of the right thigh, and then out of the basket of the matzah that was before Adonai, he took one matzah cake, one cake of oiled bread and one wafer, and he placed them on the fat of the right thigh. And he put all these in Aaron's hands and in the hands of his sons, and he waved them for a wave offering before Adonai. So literally, this El HaMeloim is the consecration ram. Literally, Melu is filling, like to fill or to place something there, to full, to, to make something full. So literally, it's the ram of filling. And literally, what he's doing is taking from this offering, and he's putting it in their hands. He's filling their hands for the work of the offering, for the work of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. He's literally filling their hands for the service. So here, Yahweh said he is, he is equipping them for the task at hand. If Yahweh calls you to a task, he will equip you, he will fill your hands to do the, what he has asked of you. We see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, where it says, May the God of Shalom make you completely holy. May your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. For the one calling you is faithful, he will do it. So whatever he's calling you to do, he will do it. He just asks us to be submitted to him and let him do it through us. In 1 Timothy 1.12, it says, I thank the one who has given me strength, the Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, that he considered me trustworthy enough to put me in his service. Again, the one who has given me strength is uh, the one who has equipped me to live this life. So he puts them in the hands of the priests and he waves them. Uh, Numbers 8, 9 through 11, let's look back at this waving. It says, you will bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation, and you shall gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together, and you shall bring the Levites before Yahweh, and the children of Israel shall put their hands on the Levites. Remember what we said about laying, laying on of hands, making an investment of identity into them? All the children of Israel are laying their hands on the Levites, saying we are uh, giving some of the authority in our life. We are showing an investment in your life to operate on our behalf. Uh, verse, verse 11, and Aaron shall offer the Levites before Yahweh, for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of Yahweh. So again, uh, all of the Levites were offered to Yahweh and lifted up, so, so to speak, to Yahweh. So it says, Aaron shall offer the Levites. Um, we read in the Hebrew, it's v'hanif aharon, so, and he is to offer et halavim uh, tenufa lifne Yahweh. The word tenufa is what we're going to look at. And what is tenufa? The Torah uses two words 
to describe the physical movement of an object as it's being sanctified or dedicated or set apart to Yahweh in the sanctuary. These two words are teruma and tunufa. Teruma and tunufa. Now, teruma refers to a vertical movement, up and down. So we're talking tunufa is being lifted, or teruma is being being upward and downward. Uh, it's, it's a commitment or devotion of the object toward Yahweh. Okay, it's given to Yahweh. Tanufa, it refers to the horizontal movement back and forth. In other words, directing the object towards the community. So as something as Truma lifted up, it is give, it's showing uh, given to Yahweh and given that example there. And Tanufa, it's it's given to the people as well. So what were the job of the, of the Levi'im? They were lifted up to Yahweh, but they were also ministering to the people as well and given to the service of the tabernacle for the community, for the people of Israel. So as the Levi'im were put in service, they were put in service on behalf of the community and their dedication to Yahweh is seen as dedication to the community. Dedication to Yahweh is seen as dedication to the people that they are serving on behalf of. Okay. So then Moshe took from their hands and he burned them up in smoke on the altar, the burnt offering. They were a consecration for the soothing aroma and offering made by fire to Adonai. Moshe took the breast and he waved it for the wave offering before Adonai. It was Moshe's portion of the Ramah's ordination, just as Adonai commanded Moshe. And so Moshe received a portion of the ordination ram as well. Again, we see in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14, don't you know that those who perform the holy services eat from the temple? And those who wait on the altar receive a share at the altar. So also Yahweh ordered those to proclaim the good news to get their living from the good news. So again, those who were serving in the altar and serving in the temple and the tabernacle was to be cared for and receive their portions from the offerings and the things that were given there. Keep moving on with the consecration ceremony. So then Moshe took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar, and he sprinkled it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his sons' garments with him. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And then, verse 31, uh, Moshe says to Aaron and to his sons, boil the meat at the entrance of the tent of meeting and eat it there, along with the bread that is in the basket of ordination, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons are to eat it. What remains of the meat and of the bread you are to burn with fire. Uh, so again, this is given the the directions and the and how they were to per perform this ordination ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, they were to receive portions. In other words, showing Yahweh is equipping them and putting them in service. And as such, He is giving them what they need to to do this service. Uh, he, Yahweh is equipping you for this life. He's equipping you and how He is calling you to live. Leviticus 8, 27 says he was to put on Aaron's hands and upon his, uh, his son's hands, and he waved them for the wave offering to Yahweh. Leviticus 8, 33 says, you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation for seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days, he shall consecrate you. It is seven days you are being consecrated. For seven days, he will fill your hands at the door. Okay. Um, here's the thing, guys. On the eighth day, the priesthood was considered in service, right? It took eight days to complete the consecration of the priesthood. Same thing for an altar. It took eight days to dedicate and set apart an altar to Yahweh. Again, there's a connection that was between the priesthood and the altar. And he says for seven days, this time of uh, setting them apart completely and and uh, not to leave the, 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 the tabernacle at all, to being set apart completely and their dedication to Yahweh and to the people. So uh, Leviticus 8, verse 33, you are not to go out from the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are fulfilled, for he will be filling your hands for seven days. So what has been done this day, Adonai has commanded to be done in order to make atonement for you. You are to stay at the entrance of the tent of meeting day and night for seven days and keep Adonai's command so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded. Thus, Aaron and his sons did all the things that Adonai commanded through Moshe. So there were boundaries to their ordination. They were being ordained and they were being set apart, but there were boundaries that were set for them. They couldn't just do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, however they wanted. There were times and things they had to be set apart, much like us, guys. There are boundaries for ordination. There are boundaries for anointing. You are called to live a set-apart life, that to be holy to Yahweh. And as such, be mindful of the service to which you are called. 
You don't live for your own. You've been bought with a price. You live for him to advance his kingdom, to show his life here in the earth. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Don't you know that you are God's temple and that the Ruach Elohim dwells among you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. You are that temple. So if we are a place for Yahweh to dwell, which we are, then we need to make it a place that is honorable for him and a place that is uh, desirable for that. You know, we are set apart. Live that way. We are a people set apart. So show his kingdom here in the earth and to be that nation that he has called us to be. You can't say we're a royal priesthood and a holy nation if you're not set apart. Now, he sets you apart, and it's up to us to live with him. And so that's where we go back again where we said, if we walk with Yeshua, walk with him. You know, if we, if we live with him, live with him. If he's called us to, to, uh, to be a different, uh, to live a different life, then live the way that he has said, you know. Yeshua said, follow me. Let's follow. All right. Okay, guys, that's all I've got for you today. So um, I pray this has been a blessing to you. I pray this has been uh, encouraging and challenging as well. And if it has been a blessing to you, then please consider sharing it. Whatever avenue you watch or you listen, whatever it, whatever it may be, please consider sharing these to help get them out there. And um, if this has been a blessing to you, then please also consider making a donation to help us continue keeping these videos out there, keep these going out. We can only do that because you've equipped us to do so, okay? So uh, if there's been a blessing to you, then please share them and please consider making a donation to help us keep, keep these things moving along, all right? So until next time, be blessed, be a blessing, and shalom.